experts are different from non-experts. I know some people don't want to believe that, but it's a truth and I'm going to prove it to you here. Experts can be hard to spot. If this cartoon up here indicates a point, they sort of look like everybody else. So when someone, say an actress named Jenny McCarthy says, oh gosh, don't get your children vaccinated against measles, mumps, and rubella, because if you do, they'll get autism, people listen. But Jenny McCarthy is an expert in acting. She's not an expert in autism or vaccines. And what she's saying is literally killing people. I know a radiation oncologist who just pulls his hair out because some of the people who come to him will refute the treatment that he's suggesting based on a Google search that they conducted. Why would you do it to an MD if you had cancer? <laughs> Uh, it's kind of crazy, but let's think some more about that. In the 1990s, there was a very, very, very bad man who wanted to get some attention. He was an autism researcher in England, and he forged his data. He made up an association between the MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, and autism. He was Found, people found out that he had lied, that he had made up false data, and he had to go to court, and he lost his job. Personally, I think he should be in jail, but I'm not a judge. Uh, based on that one study that the author himself said was fraudulent and has been proven repeatedly is fraudulent, there's this continuous belief that vaccinating your children increases the odds of them getting autism. It does not. The MMR vaccine does not, I repeat, does not cause autism. It does not increase your odds of getting autism. They're unrelated. The people who are pushing the idea that vaccinations cause autism are non-experts. Okay, now you could say, oh, Maggie, get over yourself, right? Why, do you, why are you upset about this? Well, let's take a look at the graph over here on the right. It tells you what parents believe is true or false. Now, 50% of parents correctly do not believe that there is a link between MMR vaccinations and autism. And 30% aren't sure, but 15% of parents, according to a recent survey, believe that there is a link between vaccinating your children and autism. Now, okay, so they believe that. Why is that a problem? Well, if you look at the percentage of parents who get their children vaccinated, the parents who do not believe that there's an association between vaccination and autism, 98% of their children are vaccinated. The parents who either aren't sure or believe that there is an association, only 86% of them get vaccinated. And you think, okay, well, but again, where's the big deal? Well, here it is. Uh, in the US, measles was gone. We had no measles in the US in the year 2000. It was a terrific success. Measles had been eliminated in the US because measles kill people. What do we have in, this was 2019 data, record levels of measles. We went from having no measles to record levels of measles. Why? Because people do not get their children vaccinated. Why? Because non-experts are saying that there is a link between vaccination and autism. Uh, I'll just point out an old tweet from the president who says that um, there is such an association. You need to know that there are people who literally profit from spreading this erroneous statement. What is it that these people are getting wrong? Why is it that there's no association between autism and vaccinations? Or more importantly, maybe, why do people continue to believe that there is an association between vaccinations and autism? It has to do with that old saying that I hope you learned in Introduction to Psychology, Correlation is not causation. Sometimes things correlate with each other, 
but because of some third variable. So on the far right, I have a graph that shows the number of shark attacks each month and the amount of ice cream that's sold each month. Now, you look at that and it's an incredibly strong correlation. It absolutely is a real and powerful correlation. But should we ban ice cream sales to keep people from being eaten by sharks? No, because there's a third variable that explains the correlation. When do people go and swim in the ocean? In the summer. When do people eat ice cream? In the summer. That's why the two things correlate. If people aren't swimming in the ocean, the sharks can't bite them, right? So non-experts often confuse correlation with causation. And the thing is that about the time that children get their MMR vaccinations is also about the time when people tend to notice that their children have social deficits. So it's not a function of the MMR causing autism, it's just that people tend to notice early signs of autism at when their children are about the same age as the time when children get vaccinated. It's a correlation, right? It's like the guy here saying, sleeping with my shoes on always gives me a headache. And the response is, um, Maybe you're wearing your shoes in bed because you were drunk. Same thing with the vaccination and autism. Okay. Generally speaking, why is it that people tend to disregard science? And this is increasingly a problem in the US. Uh, climate change is causing terrible devastation and yet we're not doing anything about it. Why? Because climate change is something that's described by experts and many people in the US don't think that experts are valuable anymore. Uh, right now during the pandemic, a significant proportion of Americans refuse to believe that wearing a mask and social distancing will protect them and their loved ones from getting COVID. Why? because they won't listen to the experts, the people who have actual expertise in infectious diseases. Why, why do people do this? Well, scientific explanations of phenomena tend to be complicated. They're boring, they're complicated, they're abstract, they're difficult to understand. And people feel really uncomfortable with difficult explanations. If you can come up with an explanation that's simple and easy. Oh, a particular country caused COVID. There's nothing we can do about it. Or wearing, I've actually heard this, wearing a mask causes you to, I can't even understand it, um, causes carbon monoxide buildup and so you'll suffocate? Like what kind of a mask are you wearing? A plastic bag? Um, <laughs> easy explanations are more convincing to people than complex explanations. The, if something feels easy to understand, it feels right. That's our problem. We confuse easy to understand with accuracy. Science is often not easy to understand and so many people dismiss it. What are other reasons? Well, Group pressure, and, and you know from social psychology, conformity pressure has a big impact on how we understand things in the world, how we solve problems like, oh, there's this COVID epidemic, what should I do about it? Um, and we tend to conform and believe the same things as the people around us. Um, and that is not a great basis for making decisions. So for example, Let's take a presidential election. Um, many people have friends and family who have similar political beliefs to them. Um, that creates something called a false consensus. So if you only surround yourself with people who have the same political beliefs as you, then you tend to believe that everybody must see the world the way you do. Um, so as a result, at the end of the day, say in an election counting sort of thing, like how is it that my candidate didn't win? Everybody I know voted for my candidate. The television shows that I watch say my candidate won. Of course my candidate won. Someone else must have stolen the election. 
Instead of people thinking the more difficult um, to understand concept of, okay, I have, I'm suffering from false consensus. I only hear about one point of view and I must not understand that, to pick on the United States, this country is deeply divided and just because I believe A doesn't mean everybody else believes A. False consensus. Very simple social cognitive concept that can explain an awful lot about what's going on right now. So what is an expert, right? If Donald Trump is not an expert on the COVID virus, then how can we be sure that Fauci is an expert on COVID? An expert is somebody who is extremely knowledgeable in a particular field. That's the key about expertise. It's always dependent on the field. So for example, Fauci has tremendous expertise in infectious diseases. He spent his almost his entire adult life doing nothing but studying infectious diseases and conducting research. Um, so he is an expert in this area. He is not an expert in throwing baseballs. I don't know if you saw the man throw out the first baseball and baseball season um, for the Washington Nationals, but I can throw better than that with my left hand. I mean, it was shockingly bad, right? Um, so experts have tremendous knowledge in a particular field. They can solve problems in their field faster than non-experts. They can solve problems in their field more accurately than non-experts. How can I prove it? Here's a classic study from the 1970s. You take chess experts and non-chess experts. So people who've spent a lot of time playing chess and are good at it, and people who haven't played chess and you sit them down in front of a chessboard with pieces on it. And you show them this chessboard for only five seconds, and then you give them a blank chessboard next door and say, okay, the chessboard that you just saw for five seconds, reproduce it over here. Classic memory study, right? But instead of lists of words, it's where different chess pieces were positioned on a chessboard. There's two conditions. Either the chess pieces are distributed across the board in a way that's exactly like a game of chess would unfold. In other words, the chess pieces are in meaningful positions. The other half of the trials, the chess pieces are random on the board. They don't relate to anything meaningful in terms of the game because the positions don't make any sense. What happens? If you ask people to try to remember where chess pieces are on a chessboard, and you're talking about chess boards that demonstrate a game that's in progress, then experts are much, much better than novices at remembering where the chess pieces are. So remember when we talked about chunking? Yeah, that's what experts can do. They have a great deal of knowledge about a field and they can interpret the pieces into meaningful units. Novices can't, they don't have the knowledge. Now what happens if you do exactly the same task but now the pieces, the location of the chessboard pieces are random. Now all of a sudden, poof, the difference goes away. Why? Because chess experts are experts in one thing, chess. So they can tell you exactly where chess pieces are if those pieces are part of a game, if their location is meaningful. But if you randomize the location of the pieces, you take all the meaning out of the game, they're no better than anybody else. Experts solve problems at a deeper level. They see patterns, meaningful patterns, where novices do not. Um, they recognize relevant information and they ignore things that are irrelevant. Novices, on the other hand, all we can do is hang on to superficial information. We can't notice the big patterns. We can't trigger relative, relevant knowledge because we're novices, we don't have it. So experts understand problems at a much deeper and more meaningful level than novices. Now, it's very important to remember that experts are experts in their field, period. <laughs> That's the thing about expertise. You can say somebody is really smart in their field. So maybe your psychology professors, well, I know your psychology professors are experts in psychology, but if you picked them up and said, okay, go teach this class in chemistry, it would be a disaster because just because they're smart in psychology doesn't mean they know anything much about chemistry. 
Let's pick something. Actually, we're going to pick two things that you are an expert at. So you can compare expertise to non-expertise. This is Southern California, so I know most of you know how to drive well. When you first started out driving, you had to think about everything you needed to do. Like, okay, I got to check the mirrors, check the speed. How far do I turn my radius, the, the steering wheel? Oh, I can only turn it, you know, 15 degrees. Um, okay, don't push the gas all the way down, just a little bit. A firm pressure on the brake. All these things you had to keep consciously active in your memory. But you don't do that now. Now you're an expert driver. What you have now is something called fluent retrieval. When you need the information that you need for each step of driving, say starting the car and then pulling out of your parking space, it comes to you automatically. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to think about it. It just arrives. The information that you need arrives when you need it. That's fluent retrieval. Novices don't have that. So we put a big sign on cars in California that says novice driver. Why? Because novice drivers or driver people in driver's training, they are not good drivers because they don't have fluent retrieval. They've got to be thinking about things and they might not be doing the right thing at the right time. They are novices, right? So when it comes to driving, you guys know from firsthand experience, there's a big difference between the way expert drivers drive and the way novices drive. I don't know if you've ever tried to teach someone to drive. It's terrifying. How about reading? When you first learned how to read, you had to sound out every word. You have to figure out, okay, I move my eyes from this word to that word. Oh, what is that sound? That's a special sound. All of this stuff, the mechanics of reading is where your focus was. And as a result of that, young children, when they're learning how to read, have very poor memory for the content of what they read. They don't know what they read because they're focusing so hard on the process of reading. Now you don't have to think about how to read at all. Now that you're an expert reader, everything that you have to do, the sounding out of words and syllables and knowing how far to move your eyes, it all comes automatically, right? So now because all of that is automatized, you can focus on what's the meaning behind the words that I'm reading. That's the difference between expert and novice problem solvers. So just to sum up, experts understand features in a deep way and they see relationships between factors that they're looking at, right? So you know, for example, if you are driving a car that you, you know, put on the blinker and then you need to look, right? You know, that comes automatically, the whole group. Experts can organize and do organize information in meaningful ways in their memory. Novices can't. We just sort of stick it in there and hope we can find it when we need it. Experts experience fluent retrieval of information. Uh, novices, you have to effortfully remember. Um, and experts approach problems with more flexibility. They can think about problems more deeply. Novices, we focus on the superficial level of what problems look like. Now, the last segment, we're going to focus on how do you spot a liar? That's a big problem that people have to solve today.